This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I can't believe this is the 99th episode. I'm on the cusp of 100. Thank you so much. That is due to you listening due to your emails to me, giving me support and motivation. Thank you so very much. We're going to celebrate the 100th episode next week, and I'm going to make the entire episode about answering your questions. So please feel free to send them to me. You've got one more week at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. I can't wait to hear more from you. They are confidential, of course, and if you don't want me to use them, just let me know that. But I do alter identities and places and times, etc., so that it's really quite anonymous. So let's celebrate 100 episodes together next week, and I'll look forward to you being a part of that. Today we're going to be talking once again about depression. It's many causes, it's many faces, ways you can try to avoid it, and the intense ways it can get your attention. But today we're going to focus on three hurdles, three decisions or thoughts or beliefs that can paralyze you in your own fight against what I'm terming the black dog of depression. I'm all about what you can do about it, as those of you who've listened for a while to the show know. In fact, I'll have a wonderful video in the show notes. Unfortunately, I can't let you listen to it. Plus, the animation is really neat. But it's all about someone's feeling as if their depression is like a black dog that's following them around. In fact, that term became more popularized as a term for melancholy when it was used by, for you history buffs, was used by Samuel Johnson, who was the actual creator of the English Dictionary. But the term goes back to the poetry of Horace in 40 BC and Apollonius in 1 AD. (laughs) And to make myself sound even more learned, I found out that the black dog was associated mythologically with the devil in English folklore in the 16th century. It was famously used by Winston Churchill as well. In fact, there's some people that thought that the fight with depression is what made him so purposeful in his fight against the Germans. But anyway, if you're interested in the history of the world, I'll provide you with that link in the show notes. Our listener email today is someone who fights with her own black dog of depression and is really struggling with hope. If you experience depression, you know exactly what it is. Depression has many ways that it can be created. Through years of abuse, a debilitating illness, a child with a drug problem, divorce, the death of someone you love, neglect, bullying, discrimination, never feeling adequate, the list goes on and on. Depression has many faces, agitation, anxiety, anger, not caring, giving up, sadness, melancholy, as we've talked about with perfectly hidden depression, needing to look perfect, not feeling anything at all. Depression has many ways that you can try to avoid it, through drugs, through alcohol, through working all the time or never sitting still, through distracting yourself with social media, through denial, discounting, labeling it weak, or going back to bed after you take the kids to school just trying to avoid. And depression has many ways that it tries to get your attention. You can become suicidal. You can have a severe panic attack. You can wonder what it would be like to simply drive away. You gain weight, lose weight, never sleep, always want to sleep. You're not able to focus. You can't get things done that normally you'd have no trouble accomplishing. You don't care what happens to the people you love. You hate your life. You feel a tremendous but secret loneliness. And yet, as complicated as all of that is, you can heal. It's hard work, and it becomes more complex when the depression you experience is recurrent or happens in a cycle. But there are many paths to recovery, to healing. If you get a chance to watch the video in it, it suggests 
how to gradually but persistently confront the depression that can haunt you. But you know, people struggle to do the things they're told to do, or they count far too much on antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds. And actually, the studies show that those medications may be helpful, but we really don't know for what reason. And in more moderate depressions, medications may not be that helpful at all. So what do the experts say? To fight depression, you're supposed to exercise, to move, to get enough rest, to journal, to go into therapy, to consider medications, to grieve, to recognize trauma, or to reach out to others. You know these things, but maybe you simply can't make yourself do it or do these things consistently. It's the difficult thing about depression. You're fighting to become engaged outwardly while you're struggling to break free of depression's internal grip. That's a hole that can keep you frozen. I call depression sort of an implosion of the self. And so it can feel like what you have to do to heal is to turn that energy around and to focus it outwardly. But here's what this frozenness sounds like. I know I should exercise. It's just hard to make myself want to do it. I don't like to journal. I do it, but nothing changes. Therapy doesn't work. It's too expensive. I took pills one time, and they made me sick. All of these statements are very, very common to hear. But here are the hurdles that those very statements reflect and what you can do about them, how you can confront those very hurdles. The first one is that you're waiting to feel motivated. How many people have sat on my couch, literally, and said, but I just can't get motivated to do these things? If you're actively trying to confront your depression, but you're waiting to somehow be magically motivated to change, nothing will happen. You have to make yourself do the things that are likely to help. You have to discipline yourself when you don't have a lot of energy or even hope. It's very tough. But putting motivation before action is putting the cart before the horse. I remember years ago when I was wanting to get back into graduate school, I had not done very well in the GRE. I was always a good student, but I did poorly on standardized tests, and I was dreading taking it. But at the time, my favorite soap opera was All My Children, and so I would only allow myself to watch one episode of All My Children if I'd studied for one hour for the GRE. I had to confront my own dread. I could not wait to be motivated to do it, or I would not find it. Motivation follows risking a new behavior, confronting what you don't want to confront, because afterwards, you'll be enjoying the benefits of walking a mile, swimming a lap, or just making yourself get out of bed. You cannot wait to be motivated, or that change is very likely not to happen. Whether it's exercise, going for a yearly medical checkup, or calling an old friend whose friendship you've let slip, action creates motivation, not the other way around. An example comes to mind of a patient. Kate fought me tooth and nail over the importance of exercise in managing her depression. Then one day, after a couple of years struggling with very active suicidal thoughts, she came into therapy. Well, I made myself get into the pool, and it really helped. I've always loved to swim, and suddenly I found myself more energized. I have to get up really early to get it done, and I still have to make myself go sometimes, but after it's over... I feel so much better. Getting regular physical exercise didn't cure Kate. Of course, it helped a lot. Exercise does. But just as importantly, it gave her a sense of control and a sense of hope. She believed that she could change, even when her depression seemed so unmanageable. Kate got to experience herself as being capable of change. And for someone who's depressed, that can feel like a miracle. The second thing is you may be discounting small changes. Healing usually involves a cumulative effect of many small changes. You know, I wish I had a nickel for every time a patient had said, this isn't really a big deal, but yesterday I, whatever. Any change, any risk is a big deal. 
because you're confronting your depression or anxiety in small ways, and those changes add up. What can seem unimportant, what you tell yourself is no big deal, can be a very big deal. Here's another example. Jennifer, who came into therapy after reading about perfectly hidden depression, said to me, this may not sound important again, that's familiar, right? (laughs) This may not sound important, but the other day I actually told my husband I didn't have the same perspective as he did, and I couldn't go along with what he was saying. We talked, and it went pretty well. He told me later that he couldn't believe I actually said what I was feeling. He doesn't think he knows me, and really, he's right because I don't let him know me. Maybe what Jennifer did sounds easy for some of you. Maybe it is easy for some of you. But it's not for someone who's been hiding what they really feel for years. And it was a huge, huge deal. Please give yourself credit for the small changes you make, the baby steps you make. It's so important. The third hurdle is the fact that you give up because you had one experience that wasn't helpful. You know, part of depression looks like tunnel vision, only seeing the negative. But this particular mistake, when you decide that nothing will work because one attempt wasn't effective, is a common problem in depression, but one that's very paralyzing. In fact, one of the most paralyzing. You know, I don't think any of you would parent in this way, or if you did, it would be incredibly unhealthy. You wouldn't say to a child you cared about, You know, if one idea doesn't work, just give up. No, persistence can pay off, and you know that. That's what you're probably teaching your children. Sometimes giving up happens because it's so hard to admit there's something wrong. You may have gone to a therapist once. You may have talked to your doctor. You may have talked to someone you love about it one time, and it didn't go well. You don't want to reveal it all over again. So it takes courage to continue to not give up. If one therapist doesn't help, ask around and find one with a different style or treatment regimen. If you found yoga boring, take a Zumba class. If you're nervous about prescription meds, then look for homeopathic alternatives. Sometimes you'll be surprised at what actually helps. Sitting in the sunshine, writing a note to someone who's in the hospital, striking up a conversation with the six-year-old next door, or striking up any conversation. Engagement is what's important. Engagement is what can help you change. Engagement is what will help you not give up. You're engaging with life, with others, with nature. You know, Andrew Solomon, I've quoted before on this podcast, in his book, The Noonday Demon, he said, the opposite of depression isn't happiness, it's vitality. Engagement brings with it vitality, and it brings Hope. Our listener email today is from someone who's had some lifelong depression, but her beloved husband died several years ago, and she's trying to deal with the reality of that. I found your podcast today. The first one I listened to spoke right to my heart. I lost my husband to cancer five years ago. He was the love of my life. And since that day he took his last breath, it feels like I've lost everyone who was a thread in the fabric that I knew to be my life. One thing that hurts the most is that the people who knew him act like he never existed. When you address that issue in your podcast, it was the first time in the awful years that I heard someone talk about this. I thought that I've been doing something wrong that has made people avoid me. Thank you for helping me to realize that it may not be me, but just a matter of people feeling awkward around me because they don't know what to say, or they somehow fear that the same thing might happen to them. I'm no stranger to depression. I've been on antidepressants for many years, but I think I've always been depressed. My mom started making me take diet pills when I was five. My pediatrician was a relative and prescribed them. She told me I was fat. And that somehow became who I was, even though I've always weighed far less than I should for someone my height. I could do nothing right, no matter how I tried. I made grades better than either of my siblings, but regardless of how hard I worked at it, I never measured up to them in her eyes. When I became a mother myself, I came under fire worse than ever. My sister never had children. 
When I got divorced from my first husband, my mom was mortified about what her friends would think and cut me out of the family completely. She died when I was 32, and it was the biggest relief I'd ever felt, though I tried my best not to show it because my dad and sister were genuinely grieving. My dad, he was a sweetheart. A lot of my mom's abuse happened when he was at work or out of town. However, my dad was smart and sensitive, and after her death, he spent many years showing me how much he loved me. He passed away at the age of 90. I will always miss him, but I am incredibly grateful for the years we were so close. I raised sons by myself. They're happy and successful and have my dad's sense of humor. I met and married Ron after they were adults on their own. I look back at the 18 years I had with him as the happiest of my life. Ron had a bit of trouble with my depression and couldn't understand how I could be happy and depressed at the same time. Fortunately, during our life together, the medication I was taking worked quite well. Those years were the best of my life, and I was completely unprepared for his cancer diagnosis. Since his death, life has barely been worth living. Ron and I had a family business, which I had to close, so I lost all of our income. My sister was an alcoholic all her life and is in a nursing home with dementia. She remembers who I am at times, but for the most part, she's no longer part of my life. All the advice I get to journal, meditate, volunteer, join a dating service, take dance lessons, travel, all things that may work for some people but have not worked for me. I have tried them all. I'm at the point where I don't have the will or energy to even try any of them again. This sounds a little familiar from the episode, doesn't it? My health insurance does not cover counseling, and I can't afford it. I hate that depression is winning, but I genuinely feel that I'm at a dead end. I'm not suicidal because I would never do anything that would cause my children and grandchildren pain. I would rather bear the pain and allow them to be happy. However, I can barely stand this. You have earned my trust in one podcast, so if you have any ideas at all for my situation, I'll listen. Wow, what a powerful, powerful email, and I can hear her despair through her words. So here's my response. First of all, I'm so sorry for the loss of what sounds like a man who loved you very well. I'm more than glad you found the podcast helpful, and I hope some of the others will be as well. It sounds like the advice you're getting is about engagement with others, with life, with your inner self. All of those things are worthwhile and reflect a fight against what I term the implosion of energy, very characteristic of depression. As I read and wondered what's going on that you're not finding solace or joy in any of those things, a couple of ideas came to mind. One is that you're still grieving Ron's death. I spoke to a group recently of parents whose children had died, and we focused a lot on an aspect of grief. You can get stuck in anger and despair in loneliness, fear, or bitterness. I'm not sure if or where you could be stuck, but it's an idea for you to consider. Sometimes when we think about letting go of grief or some part of it, it can feel like we're letting go of the person we're grieving, that we're losing our connection with them. It can be complicated. Of course, you have other things that were harmful in your past, which could be a factor. You say you can't afford therapy, but I suggest EMDR for the trauma you've suffered. Perhaps you could rethink the value of that. EMDR is a much more solution-oriented focus and can make really significant differences in a short time. Or even online therapy might be an option, much less expensive, but perhaps helpful. Another idea is that you could take a look at your medication to see if there might be another idea that would work. There are alternative treatments for depression that's chronic and deep. Ketamine infusions, for example. Thanks for reaching out, and I hope some of this might be helpful to you. I think that's an important point about grief, is that sometimes letting go of it can feel like you're abandoning the person that you loved. Now, this listener obviously had tremendous trauma from her mother and found great joy in a partner who loved her well. But perhaps those feelings of anger and bitterness are starting to reside in her instead of her working through them. So she answered me. What I loved is that she answered me. Thank you so much. I wasn't even expecting to hear from you, especially so soon. I'm sure letting go of the grief probably is an issue. Just about everyone I know is married, so it's a constant reminder. But I will keep that in mind. I do wish Ron and I had had more years together. And I think it would have been easier if my sister were still herself. She was never married, and we were very close. 
It's hard to have her alive but really gone. It's so weird that I can call and hear the same voice, but not the same person, if that makes sense. I didn't even know what EMDR was. Thank you for suggesting that. I do think my current meds are not working as well as they did, and I'm fortunate to have an excellent psychiatrist who's very responsive when I tell him I think I need a change. So I sincerely appreciate your response and suggestions. I guess the whole message of this episode and this listener email is to try very hard not to give up. Depression can be overwhelming, but I've seen many people find their courage, find their persistence, find what's keeping them stuck, and they can move through it. Good luck to you if you're one of those people. Again, my gratitude for being with me today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Many of you, I think, are dealing with depression, and so I hope that it was helpful. As I said in the introduction, please send me an email, especially for our 100th episode at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. My website is DrMargaretRutherford.com, and if you subscribe there, you'll receive a weekly blog post and podcast in a weekly newsletter. Thank you so much for the ratings and reviews. I actually got over 200 last week. That was sort of a a fantasy of mine to do that. So thank you for that. And I love the written reviews, as I've said before on many podcasts. It gives me a sense of what you like and what you don't like. One of the things I'm finding out that you really like is they're a lot shorter than other podcasts. So I'll try to keep them short and succinct. There's another way to interact with me. I have a new closed group on Facebook. You can join by going to facebook.com slash groups slash self-work and just answer three questions. That's all. We have a very diverse group from all over the world, and I'm really enjoying it. We're giving strength, empathy, laughter, and friendship to one another. And I call that self-work as well. Thanks again so very much. On to episode 100. It's because of you that that's happening, and I could not be more appreciative. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work. <laughs>